Wendy's on camera question first. Do you want to sit or do you want to just ask him from a distance? Um, no, I think it doesn't matter. Just, just want to just run over here. Do you want to sit? Do you want to sit? Uh, over here. Over here. Rolling? Yeah. You've been doing these for a long time now. Um, can you do you still enjoy it? And can you tell me what you like most about it? And if you think people are listening to you on the radio? When I started thinking that we've been in the radio business myself, that people weren't still listening, I probably wouldn't be here <laughs> anymore. But I do like it. I like radio for one thing. I always have that being in my background. But also, it's an opportunity. There are so many things that get misunderstood, and particularly in the way they're played up, that it's an opportunity to uh, set the record straight, and uh, during those six minutes, no one can argue with me. And you really enjoy doing it? Yes. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, how you uh, deliver your radio address. Your aide, uh, Patrick Buchanan, says he likes to give you a chance to uh, shock people out of their lethargy. <laughs> Other people say that they like to give you an opportunity to get something off your chest. What, well, what, uh, well, how do you view what you do with the radio? Well, that's a, that's a good part of it. As I say, in the discussion, and I know I don't mean this deliberate distortions or anything, but most people, particularly in the media and even the members of the administration, don't have access to all the information on a lot of issues. And uh, there's conversation, and then there are talk shows and so forth, and all of this. And uh, sometimes I sit there frustrated and say, "Look, you don't know the whole truth yet, and what you're discussing. And uh, here is an opportunity to uh, to straighten the record on some of those things." Your aides also say that you take a great personal interest uh, in crafting your speeches, yes. and that you are uh, very careful about the timing. Uh, that you come out oh. perfectly on time. Well, Is this something that you've gotten from your training? Uh, well, yes. Having been in radio and television, I know the importance of time. And uh, it has to come out at exactly five minutes. And so I've got my own system of timing. And that's why when I'm on, you'll see somebody with their hand coming down frequently. Uh, that's because I have marked it minute by minute. And I can tell whether I'm ahead or behind in my timing by a mark there, mm -hmm. a check mark that I've made on the script and where that finger comes down. But they also say that you're uh, known as one take Ronnie. <laughs> so do you have to uh, go through it very often in order to practice so that you deliver it right on time? Not an awful lot. Uh, I, I do the timing and uh, then maybe glance at it while I'm sitting here uh, uh, waiting for the, uh, for the broadcast to start. And, uh, that's about it. Who is it that you think that you are talking to? Is it one of your aides said that when you approach that microphone, as though that microphone is a person? Are you thinking of someone in particular when you give your addresses? Or are you talking to America as a whole? What's in your mind about who your audience is? Well, now, you go way back to my sports announcing days on that. Uh, I. I would get mail, and uh, and it would frequently remark that it, I sounded like I was talking directly to them, these people, and I couldn't figure this out. How, how, where, where did they? How did they get that idea? And then I realized that a group of friends of mine that usually gathered in a barber shop, uh, where I was a customer also, to listen to the ball game broadcast, and lots of times the things I said I was thinking of them, and if it was any little quip or anything, I was doing it for them. But everybody listening got that same effect, and I, I learned then that the microphone with the camera, um, if you start thinking, I am talking to an audience out there of X millions of people, uh, you're going to have a, an impersonal tone as compared to thinking, um, if I'm talking to somebody I know about this and trying to convince them that it'll sound that way to everybody listening. How do you compare doing a radio address? It's a rather isolated, although there's more people here than I would have expected, <laughs> uh, to giving a speech. Um, do you enjoy being out in the crowds or you have a very intimate relationship with radio? 
Oh well, yes, but you I, them? but I also I also enjoy very much getting out with the people and, and uh, talking with the people. But it's I think it's it's pretty much the same tone. It's just that uh, in this case I'm doing the same thing only I can't see them, but I figure they're there. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, large parts of the country that have trouble getting the radio address. Uh, some networks don't carry it, or little stations don't have it. Okay. Um, what do you think about that? Well, you always wish it could be otherwise, but I know it can. But then uh, I found that the media does give us pay some attention to these broadcasts, and uh, so at least a part of them uh, is carried then later in the day or the next day to more people. Do you listen to the newscasts then that uh, uh, pick up on your? Uh, oh, I try to I try to listen to the news and keep abreast of the news in the in the press. Uh, Do you ever say, oh, they got it just right, or? They got it all wrong. Once in a great while, I say they got it just right. <laughs> Let's get one more question. Okay. Um, I was wondering where, where you got your voice. Have you trained yourself to speak? No, I... People often talk about how they feel as though you put them in the same room with you. Well, as I said, way back in, in the radio days, I, I learned uh, that secret that... You know, they used to talk in radio when it was so relatively new. They used to talk about mic fright. Well, that was when the person stood there and looked at that microphone in front of them and suddenly thought X millions of people are out there listening and they would freeze up inside. I, as I say, I have always thought that if you just keep in mind you're talking to somebody you know, uh, that. Uh, you know, you don't get that, but then anyone else listening gets that same feeling. Is it true you borrowed your father's Oldsmobile to look for a job in radio? Um, he felt kind of sorry. I'd been hitchhiking all around the northern Illinois and Chicago and all, uh, uh, looking for a job, and uh, then finally came home, and there was a, a new national store that had opened in our hometown, and they were looking for someone to head up the sports department. And this was the Great Depression. A job was a job. And uh, I didn't get that job. And I guess uh, I guess he thought I was pretty disappointed, and then I said that I'd like to go down to the Quad Cities and uh, where there were a couple of radio stations and try again, and this time I didn't have to hitchhike. He let me borrow the car. And uh, I got a job. WHO is starting to run your uh, radio buses again. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Appreciate My pleasure. It. I'm going to have to remove the microphone. I thought that get was... you back to business. <laughs> oh, all right. Excuse me. My fellow Americans, this weekend we mark the 92nd observance of Labor Day, a day when we celebrate the strong backs, keen minds, hard work, and dedication that have made America the mightiest nation on earth. We celebrate this land of immigrants and their descendants, the men and women who came to this land in search of freedom and hope and the opportunity to make an honest wage. We honor the laborers who built our great cities brick by brick, who poured the concrete, laid the macadam, and riveted the steel girders. The worker in the factory and the farmer in the field, the secretary at a desk and the trucker at the wheel of a semi hauling freight from coast to coast. And today, we also celebrate good news for America's workers. We've seen 45 months of economic expansion and the creation of over 10.5 million jobs, 1.6 million in the last seven months, 200,000 just last month alone. Employment figures have never looked better. 61.2% of all Americans 16 years old and up, male and female, are working. That's the highest employment ratio since they started keeping records. Because we cut taxes and squashed inflation, America's workers once again can have faith in the future. They know they'll get a fair reward for their labor and that more and more of their paycheck won't be swallowed up by big government. The Census Bureau reports that real median family income rose in 1985 for the third year in a row. Inflation is the lowest it's been in more than 20 years, and interest rates continue to drop, making home ownership possible once again for average Americans. Average income Americans, I should say. In other words, more Americans are working. They're earning more, and their money is going farther. More good news, economic growth is winning against poverty. In the past, big government policies of high taxes mixed with high inflation pushed millions into poverty. Well, we turned that around. 
Poverty has dropped for the second year in a row as jobs and opportunity conquer dependence and hopelessness, once again proving that a growing, vibrant economy is the best anti-poverty program there is. Now, some workers in some sections of the economy haven't benefited from our prosperity. I'm thinking especially of some of our farmers who, after years of government interference in agriculture, are having difficulty adjusting to a non-inflationary economy. Record levels of farm supports are helping farmers weather hard times, and we're committed to helping them move to a market-oriented farm economy. Also, the changing face of industry has left some workers without jobs. Where unfair foreign trade practices the culprit, this administration will continue to be the most aggressive ever in protecting the rights of American workers, making sure that free trade is also fair trade. Our Job Training Partnership Act has also helped over two million workers find new jobs. But the best answer is tax reform. By cutting tax rates, we're going to rev the engines of entrepreneurship and job creation. We're raising exemptions for dependents and giving families a long overdue break, and we're dropping millions of working poor off the income tax rolls altogether. Tax reform will be the best thing to happen to the American worker since... Well, since our tax cut in 1981. That's why I urge Congress this Labor Day to remember our responsibility to America's working men and women and waste no time passing tax reform when they return to Washington. You know, some people say it's America's natural resources that make our country so great. But the greatest resource of all is our working men and women, their skill, hard work, guts, and determination. It's like the fellow who took some land down by a creek bottom, all covered with brush and rocks, and he cleared the brush and he hauled the rocks away, and then he started cultivating and he planted, and finally he had a beautiful garden. He was so proud that one Sunday after the church service, he asked the minister if he wouldn't come and see what he'd done. So the minister came by, and when he saw the corn that had been planted there, he said he'd never seen any corn so tall, and the Lord had really blessed this land. And then he looked at some melons and said he'd never seen any as big as that, and uh, Thank the Lord for that, and he went on praising the Lord for everything, the squash and the beans and everything else. The farmer was getting a little fidgety. Finally, he interrupted and said, Reverend, I wish you could have seen this place when the Lord was doing it all by himself. Well, I've always liked that story because it makes an important point. God gave us this great and good land, but it's up to us to make it flourish, to preserve its freedom and to see it grow in greatness. And this Labor Day, thanks to the American people, our country is growing stronger every minute. I just have one final thing to say. Keep it up, America. You're doing great. Until next week, thanks for listening, and God bless you. Cut. They owe me five seconds. I was five seconds short. Well, how did that go? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> what? How did that go? Yeah. Yeah. Well, some four seconds. Yeah, five seconds a little, uh, a little longer. Is that a little? Are you ever shorter or longer than five seconds short? Oh. Not. No, and usually you come out pretty close to the mark because in that last minute, where I've got all the marks, for that last minute, then I have looked at where my second hand is when uh, he gives me the signal. So then, for that last minute, I know whether to speed up or slow down watching that second hand go around. And this time, I couldn't stall any longer. I was a few seconds ahead. Four seconds off. Four seconds, sorry. Very aware of our time. Hi, Mr. President. How are you? What else are you doing there, please? Looks like somebody scout Buckley again. Looks like somebody scalped Lucky and did it.